Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Can Taiwan Depend on a Volunteer Force? And joining us from Taipei, Taiwan, is Lieutenant Colonel Scott Ellinger, United States Army, retired. Uh, before retiring, uh, Scott served as a security assistance officer at the American Institute in Taiwan. He has over 20 years of experience in living in Asia. And during his military career, he was a foreign area officer, which uh, gave him a lot of very specialized training about all aspects of Asia. Welcome to Asian Review. It's great to have you back with us. Well, thank you, Bill. It's a, it's a great honor being on your show for a second time, which uh, is a great honor for me. And I, I enjoy uh, you know, giving some of my, my inputs here, reference uh, Taiwan and the all-volunteer force. Super. Well, let's get right into it because we only have 30 minutes and uh, that time really flies on by. You know, I remember the days when the Taiwan military had a personnel strength of between 550,000 and 600,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen. And now personnel strength is less than half of that. Um, universal conscription is being replaced by the volunteer force. How did this change evolve? And, and what's your reflection on it? Well, I do remember uh, about 10 years ago, uh, almost 12 years ago, when I was at the Pentagon and I was the Taiwan Affairs Director at the Pentagon, and the the discussions with MND and the Joint Staff and OSD back in the United States, as well as uh, the other U.S. military services, we took a hard look at assisting them with this transition. So from my knowledge, I know it's been going on for about 12 years, uh, maybe 11 years, where it became very serious was probably in 2009, 2010. And there was a lot of um, uh, interaction between uh, the U.S. Um, Joint Staff, OSD, and the services with Taiwan and, and really assisting them with the experiences the United States had with our all-volunteer force uh, transition back in the 70s and 80s. And we went through a lot of things that dealt with the recruiting aspect, the retention aspect, as well as the veteran services and the retirement programs that was important for a sustained long-term type of transition because it's not just recruiting new people for an all-volunteer force. It also included the entire long-term investment in recruiting a soldier, a Marine, a sailor, and an airman into the services. And it was a long-term uh, type of investment, as we used to call it with them, is you're investing in a human being for, you know, four years, eight years, 20, 30, and you have to think it from a, a long-term haul. So we worked with them specifically on uh, the, these phases that you need to focus on uh, with that. And the other part we worked with that I thought was uh, very unique was we worked on the actual marketing strategy of each service. Mm. So that, you know, the Army has their marketing, Marine Corps, and uh, Navy and Air Force. But we, what we really stressed with them was the, the focus of the Marine Corps, the U.S. Marine Corps, and their marketing strategy. And I think as us, as Americans, we definitely know the Marines, you know, the, the, the few, the proud, the Marine. And their marketing strategy in the United States is definitely one of the strongest ones. Therefore, we put a lot of time with, uh, with the Marine Corps Recruiting Command for them to focus on their marketing strategy and how it's very effective uh, overall in the United States. Okay, well, that's that's a really good explanation of how it evolved. Uh, I learned a few things just then uh, in listening to your answer. But uh, okay, from today's perspective, what's your reflection on this? Is it going well? Are there glitches? Uh, some people would say it's been a disaster. Um, I don't know. What's your what's your take? Well, we'll go back to about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and you could see within M&D there was a very eager type of uh, reaction to it. They wanted to learn everything about this transition and the experiences from the United States. Uh, so we, we met with uh, our service components, we met with joint staff, and we went over these uh, experiences that we had on quite a few of the exchanges and visits that we had. Uh, after that part, um, from my personal perspective, you could see there was a lot of discussions in 2008, 2009, and going into 10 and 11 on how are we going to do this? 
uh, was the Taiwan kind of uh, part of it. And observing them that, that is like what we discussed about a year and a half ago. There's you know a lot of road bumps in it. Um, but the other part that was really tricky, and that was about 2011 all the way up to 2015-16, was we have to implement it. And the implementation was getting closer, but they didn't know when they really wanted to implement it, uh, implement it on an exact date. And so it keeps on getting kind of kicked down the road, you know, getting pushed and pushed. And I think this year or next year, it's exactly – it institutes for everybody. It's going to be the four month uh, kind of like basic training, get some basic infantry skill sets. And then after that is done, then you'll be put into the mobilization system in the reserve system. And that's going to be, and I think it, it starts uh, next year, from what I recall uh, from reading the news. That's what's going to happen. So now, let me jump in here because because I want to clarify something. So there still is a conscription system. In other words, Correct. men are still going to have to do this four months of training and then and the annual, theoretically, the annual reserve training. Well, no, it's it's not the just annual. It's going to be within a, I think it's eight to ten year period. They have to be mobilized twice. Okay. And within the, and that's their mobilization, kind of like a, a very uh, for the U.S. reserves or National Guard. That would be like where they do it every summer for two weeks. This is like. Think about it. They do it twice in, a, in an eight-year period. They have to be mobilized twice to fulfill some requirements. But I do know that it's been grandfathered, grandfathered and I think there's still some people that have to do uh, up to 14 months of, you could say, conscription active duty service. I've heard that but as I well. Think it, I think the grandfather clause is just about over for a certain age group. And I think it's starting 2019. I'm not sure, uh, but it's it's going to be the exactly four months, and then they'll be pulled off of active, you know, this four month active time, and then they'll be put into the reserve mobilization system. So we have so. a hybrid system in actuality. We have a volunteer system plus we have a system that still depends on this uh, short term conscription system. That's correct. Okay. And good. But you know, remember, the old system was they were conscripted for three years, then it, then it morphed to about two, and then it went to about a year and a half, 14 months, and now we're in the four months. So Korea has gone through a very similar process where it used to be three years, then it went to about two and a half, now it's two. But I'm not up to, up to the news in Korea where they've changed from two years and made it shorter. But I do know it's very similar to how Korea went through their evolution from that part. But Taiwan has always had, you can volunteer as a non-commissioned or as an enlisted and go into the non-commissioned rank. So that volunteer part has always been there. It's just their system of training and how they become an NCO is a little bit different. I think we'll talk about where sometimes the, uh, from Vietnam, if you remember, remember the shake and bake NCO? Mm -hmm. uh, Taiwan kind of creates a lot of their NCOs in that kind of old system of shake and bake. Okay. where they'll send them to an NCO academy, and we'll talk about it in a moment if you have that, okay, you have that kind of question. Let, let's talk about, so it seems to me Taiwan is still going to have trouble meeting needed personnel levels. Uh, from what I've read in the news, that is a discussion where uh, they're not meeting the requirements. I knew from the news you could read, uh, or I've read that in their military academies, they're not meeting the, the personnel requirements that they have for the incoming freshman classes and coming in. So I know that was uh, last year had that mm -hmm. discussion point within the news that m and is struggling to make that. Uh, I do know from experiences and reading the news that for some reason, the female volunteer force in Taiwan for the, for the enlisted non-commissioned officer ranks is pretty much up at its, its limits. So... Mm -hmm. For those positions that they have, they're recruiting very well within the female uh, 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 dynamic. So that one's recruited very well. It's, it's not the male part. <laughs> and know, they're, they're not meeting the both officer and the enlisted. It, it seems to me also, as you pointed out to me the other day, there was an article uh, just two days ago, I guess it was, in the Taipei Times, talking about the budgetary concerns here. Well, first of all, the military wants a lot of money. It wants to build its new Air Force trainer. It has a submarine project that's going on. Um, 
if you have a volunteer military, it costs you more money. And so the military budget is growing. And, out, and yet again, it's up against competition from uh, what you might call social welfare programs. Um, I wonder where all this is going to go. It's, well, it's up against a lot of U.S. pressure, too, to spend more on defense. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, when you look at the Taiwan budget and you go back 15 years, it's been pretty static where it sits anywhere from about 10.5 all the way up to about 10.9 uh, 10 billion U.S. dollars. And so it's been very static mm. uh, with that. And then you have the procurement programs, you have the training programs, and then you have the personnel programs. Mm -hmm. And the, the article is talking about that within the whole entire government budget uh, for personnel, like I think it was 53%, but you have to re revisit the article to get the specific number, that that's what made up the personnel budget. And the, the legislative UN and the people within the legislature were discussing this point, and um, they were shocked and like, oh my gosh, this is too much money. Uh, what are we going to do? And M&D, they kind of throw it back on M&D to make, make the fix. But the budget stays fixed. Uh, we discussed a year and a half ago, this is something for the executive branch. It's something for the legislative UN that deals with defense and, and foreign affairs. Uh, it, it, it's up to them to really figure out this requirement and budget it correctly. Mm -hmm. What I've seen here is, and it's unfortunate, is the executive and the, the legislative Departments that are responsible for their national defense, just push it and give it all to M and D. Oh, you guys fix it, but we're still giving you a static uh, number of this is your budget, but now go fix it. And then you have M and D sitting there. Okay, uh, we're still at the same amount of money. How do we have to rob Peter to pay Paul? Where are we going to rob Peter? Um, and so they have these issues of. There's a lot of stress, and this is what's been going on for the last seven or eight years is M&D's been forced to make the change. So this is in the Mind Joe administration. It's like, here's your budget. We're not giving you anything else. Uh, now you run into this administration, the Tiny One administration, and it's like, same thing. Uh, here you go. Uh, you're, you have a fixed number, and now make the change. Mm. We're in the United States. When you look from the Carter transition into the Reagan administration, Reagan increased the budget and specifically focused on the personnel budget and really gave the U.S. military the budgetary requirements to make this dynamic change. And, of course, it took us you know, 10, 15 years just to get it implemented change, but there was a budget for it on top of the training, the procurement, the acquisition, and other things. So the budget was there to make the transition, so it was increased. Okay. So Taiwan really needs to take a hard look in the legislative and executive uh, branches to actually consider the military separate from all the other civil soldiers. We have, what, so we have uh, about 45 seconds to a break here. Oh. Uh, um, so I, I just put that out to you, so it'll give you enough time to wrap up your answer. <laughs> Okay, we'll do it. Okay. So you're okay there. Okay. Um, well, I, you know, just a quick point I'll just shove in here in the last 30 seconds we have before the break. It always seemed to me that Tsai and Wen really would like to restore the old system of conscription, but she knows she can't because her, her base is based on young people and they're not really in the old fashioned model of conscription. And this volunteer thing, uh, they're really trying uh, to make it work. So I, I don't think we're going to see the old conscription system restored in Taiwan. Although a lot of people would like it. Uh, I, I mean, Tsai Ing-wen herself, from what I understand. Well, it, when we, you know, after the break, we'll, we'll kind of we'll peel back this onion on uh, some, some thoughts here. And so, and, and the thing is, is that uh, from our perspective, and I'll talk a little bit from the U.S. perspective of why you have to take care of your national defense uh, system, because that's the cherished bread and butter of your national uh, pride, your, your nation's defense, your nation's security. So if you're going to cut something and you're going to work with the budget, that's the one part that you 
don't touch in a negative way. You have to okay, I think we're going to have to stop here, and we'll pick this up when we come back from the break. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is retired Lieutenant uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel Scott Ellinger. He's coming from us uh, to us from Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, before retiring, he was a security assistance officer at the American Institute in Taiwan, and years and years of experience in living in Asia. We'll be right back in one minute, so don't go away. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can beat the world, you can beat the war, you could talk to God, go banging on his door, you can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. I'm getting older. Do I need to worry about falling? Yes, you do. Each year, one in four people 65 and older will experience a fall, and many will be serious. The majority of falls happen at home, so remove things that could make you trip and install handrails to keep you steady. To learn more about the steps you can take to help prevent a fall, please talk to your doctor. You can also visit aarpfoundation.org or medicaremadeclear.com slash falls. This message was brought to you by United Healthcare and AARP Foundation. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is Can Taiwan Depend on a Volunteer Force? And joining us uh, from Taipei, Taiwan, via Zoom, um, is uh, retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Scott Ellinger. Uh, Scott, before retiring, was a security assistance officer at the American Institute in Taiwan and has years and years of experience uh, living in Asia. Moreover, before he retired, he was a fire and area officer, which is a great program the military has, the Army has, to train uh, Army officers to be conversant in all aspects of Asia societies. Okay, before the break, um, we were talking about um, uh, we want to finish up our conversation we were engaged in before the break, and we're talking about um, Tsai and Wen really has this kind of inkling that she would like to restore the traditional conscription system, but she knows she just can't do that. So let's finish up on that, not spend too much time, and then we'll move on to the pension, pension reform. So I, I think we're, it, it's, it's going to have to be an overall national security council type of discussion with MND and other uh, ministries that have to do a complete overhaul and look at the defense requirements of Taiwan and what the future requirements are going to be in the next 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. And they're going to have to make a hard decision. And unfortunately, for whatever president uh, has to make this, this decision, it may be an unpleasant decision if the all-volunteer force does not transition the way that they want. Mm -hmm. But we discussed that real quick, and it'll, it'll probably go on a pension, but it's the budget requirement. And they have to have the budget correctly set to do the transition. And we worked with Taiwan on this uh, transition and the requirements on budget, budgetary, uh, the budgetary requirements to make this transition. So it's been discussed in... The, the MND, along of correction, the executive branch and the legislative UN really have to focus on uh, setting aside a budget that allows MND to make this transition. So it's kind of in the, the balls in the legislative UN court on the national budget and setting it for MND to make it. That would be a very simple fix for them to actually transition to an all volunteer force versus bringing back inscription. Okay, that's that's uh, that, that's a there are a lot of things there to think about. But uh, let's move on to the national pension plan, especially uh, we should say the military pension plan, because uh, Tsai Ing Wen has sought to reform all of Taiwan government uh, pension plans. Uh, she's gotten a real lot of opposition, big street demonstrations uh, from retired military folks. So uh, let's pick it up from there and uh, fill us in on how this um, military pension reform is, is working its way out. Well, it, it's, uh, it's overall the, the, the entire pension system for uh, certain parts of uh, their civil service 
people. Mm -hmm. And with that, you have the military. I think teachers was in there. And I can't remember the third uh, civil service group that was included in this, but it was something where they wanted to change um, their pension structure uh, because I think the, the, the funds that they had and the fund, uh, the trust fund or the type of fund that they had was if they kept on the old system, it would go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And so they had to modify something to make it happen. And unfortunately, they lumped them all together. And I know from about a year and a half ago to now, it, it, uh, there was quite a few protests, and I think it was just earlier this year that uh, it was approved and it was not received very well. And I was, right before the break, I was going to say, when you look at your national security apparatus at, at large and your national budget, you have all these different programs and different departments. The, the, one, the one thing that the United States, regardless of it's Democrat or Republican, you don't touch and you don't mess around like the, the taking a stick and hitting a beehive, <laughs> which Taiwan did. The stick and started hitting the beehive and stuck it, and all the bees are coming out. They made that mistake because they made it political. Parties are playing with it. You don't touch veterans, uh, the veteran program. You don't touch that. You don't touch and, and decrease your retirement system. You don't mess around with salaries. You don't mess around with the uh, pension program long term. But they did it, and they they should have just they they should have taken it separate and make it its own program and not lump it with all civil service because your bread and butter of national security and your national system that's going to defend you is your uh, your Department of Defense or your Ministry of National Defense and all the services. Because in Taiwan, this national treasure, the, the, the military, HADR, so who's the first one called to, to rescue somebody in the mountains after a typhoon or a flood or an earthquake? Who does all the digging? Military, military. is called first, first responders, but the military is the one that does everything. And so why do you want to take that stick and go into the beehive and, and, and stir it up? And unfortunately, it's caused a lot of friction. Uh, in Taiwan over the last mm. six months. Mm. Well, it seems to me this situation is quieting down now, though. Uh, what's your sense? Uh, I, I can say from a, from a news perspective, yes, it's quieted down. But if you go back six months ago, you had a lot of unhappy veterans or right. soon-to-be veterans were not happy with this because I think it's it's morphed over a three-year period. You had the old K KMT directed system of this pension that was to take care of the old term, uh, the old timer KMTs, uh, KMT officers and non-commissioned officers. So, and then it morphed into something else, and now they have a hybrid system uh, that gives them their pension process, but it it, it, it got cut. Right, right, so, right, right. People that are retired already had their pensions cut. I really. Yeah. So it wasn't That's hard to swallow. And so the MND really needs to take a look at what we discussed with them. Recruiting is one. Retention is another. And retirement is another in the veterans programs. It's, it's one big package. And unfortunately, they didn't take it as one. They kind of sliced it into three areas and worked at them at different angles where they didn't look at it as a comprehensive one to the end type program. Go ahead. Okay. Well, time is racing on here, so uh, let's get to the reserves. And um, you know, um, I think I mentioned this on uh, a, another show that we had recently here. Um, the Global Taiwan Institute in Washington held its annual um, uh, Global Taiwan Symposium. I think it was two weeks ago, perhaps three weeks ago. Jim Moriarty, the chairman of AIT, American Institute in Taiwan, gave the keynote speech, and in that he um, touched on the need for Taiwan to ramp up its reserve system. Also, uh, Shirley Khan, uh, who's also appeared on the show, as has Jim Moriarty, um, in her comments at the Global Taiwan Symposium, she also talked about the need for Taiwan to ramp up its reserve system. Taiwan seems to be, um, how should I say, confused about how to rationalize its reserve system. How to make it a more yeah, well, credible we, part of its overall defense posture. Yeah, well, we talked about this a year and a half ago, the first time I was on your show. We actually talked about this where it, 
I, I think a great example would be looking at the United States National Guard and U.S. Reserve System for the Air Force, the Army, and the Marines, mm -hmm. and the Navy. Uh, so if somebody does four years active duty or six years or eight years, they can go into a reserve system and be a part-time soldier or a part-time Marine or sailor or airman. I'm sorry I have to use all of our things. Sure, we don't want to overlook Army. anybody. And we don't mean to so, slight the I mean, Coast Guard, but that's a different component of the Taiwan government. Yeah, they, they fall under the Ministry of Interior in Taiwan. Okay. So they're, but, oh, well, we won't talk about that. But actually, they have a lot of Navy go in there later, later after they're done with their Navy service. Okay, but the main thing is, we, we've discussed it, and I think would be a really good thing is if MND really looks at the U.S. system, because then you'll have a professional part-time soldier if you look into maybe the, the Israeli model or some other models or the Swiss model, I think it doesn't fit as well. But because Taiwan is a is a is a true democracy modeled after uh, the United States and some other the constitutional uh, constitutional monarchy, the the reserve system of how the U.S. is set up, I think, is a great model for Taiwan to follow. And of course, they'll have to make some changes. Uh, to, to fit their requirements, but that's how you keep a professional core of people. And if they created that system, I think it would be very effective versus the mobilization system that they have, which um, how do you keep somebody actually proficient in their skill and the old mobilization, the, the mobilization system they have today? Uh, it, that's a good point. I don't, that's a very good point. The term, it doesn't cut the mustard, and I think we used that term a year and a half ago. So they, <laughs> they really have to take a hard look at the U.S. system, and I think the budgetary requirement, I think, would, I think they can make it happen. It's just that they, it goes back into making the change. They have to make the change. You know, just have the courage to make this change. But it goes back to... Legislative UN has to give them the budget to do it. Yeah, you I've heard say, that. I've heard that from people it. that are uh, also familiar with the reserve system. That the big hang-up is money, 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 and and, and equipment. Okay, if you have this uh, built-up reserve system, then it costs more money, and you also have to give them more equipment, and that all comes down to again money. Just what you're saying. Um, let's. So, uh, and it goes back. Okay, well, we only got a couple minutes left here, and um, um, we have one minute left, I'm just told. <laughs> and very briefly, very briefly, um, within one minute, what sort of enlistment incentives does Taiwan use to get people to enroll, or I should say sign up for the military, and also, as we would say in the U.S., to re-up? Uh, the re re retention, I, I don't know about the retention system, but I do know within the uh, recruiting system, the incentives are, uh, they've actually increased the salaries quite a bit. So it actually, it is lucrative for young people to come in. But again, it's, there's, it rolls into, okay, when I go in, what do I do after I leave? <laughs> and right, right, right. Looking kind of like we have the GI Bill and some, you know, Ministry of Education has to get involved on, on you know, scholarship programs or something that meets Taiwan's needs can't be exact clone of the United States, but right. it meets needs of what will incentivize a soldier to raise their hand and volunteer. And we talked about that a year and a half ago. But if they do have incentives there, but I think it still needs to be tweaked a little bit. It goes back into increasing the budget a little bit. Not, not too much, but they have to increase this budget. Well, the evil clock has just bit us again, and we're out of time. Well, this, this subject, could, we could go on and on and on on this. this. is a really interesting subject. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate your insight, your long years of experience in Asia. Your military background is really, you know, really brings a lot to bear to this show. And thank you very much for watching. Uh, we'll see you again next week when my guest will be uh, retired U.S. Navy Captain Jim Kimo Fennell. Uh, before he retired, he was the N2 of Pacific Fleet, and he's going to talk about how to build a 350-ship Navy. So it should be a really good show. We'll see you then. It'll be great to, good, great to hear uh, Jim's uh, analysis. Great, great. Tune in then. Oh, we'll do, we'll do. Okay. <laughs>